Well, we had the big fires in 2017, and I was already on the waiting list for a hearing dog because of my um, profound hearing loss. I don't and, hear anything. Uh, and when I realized how vulnerable that made me and my family, um, I realized that I should go ahead and get the dog because there were too many possibilities of uh, tragedy occurring. If we couldn't hear our neighbors at the door or if we couldn't um, you know, hear the phone ring, things like that would be a real uh, possibility for tragedy. I am a type 1 diabetic. This is Ricky, my service dog. She's a diabetes alert dog and she alerts on my blood sugar levels anywhere from 10 to 45 minutes before my Dexcom, my continual glucose monitoring system, picks it up. And mainly what he does for me is he picks things up. Like if I drop my phone or I drop my keys, he'd pick them up for me. He could also open doors for me. More than, more than just the physical stuff that he does for me, he opens a lot of doors metaphorically because people talk to me a lot more since I've gotten him. Well, the way that August helps me is that when he hears a sound that I have customized at home so that he has learned to hear the doorbell, a door knock, my cell phone ringing, he hears the sound and then he comes to me and does a thing that's called an alert. He takes his nose and he pounds it into my thigh to let me know, or my, uh, my arm sometimes, depending if I'm lying down, to let me know that it's ringing or someone's at the door. And then I ask him, what? And he takes me to the sound. So then I know that it's the door or the phone or um, for smoke alarms, he's been trained to go into a down position so he doesn't take me to the fire. Last night at like 2 a.m., my blood sugar just kind of decided to crash for no good reason, it just started to go down and she actually popped up and started snorting in my face to wake me up because that's her nighttime alert as she kind of gets into bed and goes <laughs> and that's how she wakes me up. So she woke me up at about, I think it was two or three in the morning and I checked my blood sugar and even though my sensor said I was fine, I was like 65, which is pretty low. And so I got to eat some M&Ms and give her a bunch of treats and a lot of love, and then we both went back to sleep. So she. I've had him home. I've had him for about six years now, and I still, you know, reinforce training every day, and I've trained him a few new things too, which is is fun. Like I've trained him to a command that I call wiggle, where if it's raining outside and we go into a restaurant, I'll say wiggle and he'll shake off the water before we get to a table. Puppy raising is the most amazing thing ever. Um, you get to start with an eight week ball of fluff and teach them everything from toileting on command outside to um, sit down, shake, all those fun things. Uh, you get to see them experience things for the first time. Uh, my favorite is when they see windshield wipers for the first time and their face watches the windshield wipers in the car. Yeah, yeah. Um, these dogs know over 40 different commands. So they're trained by their puppy raisers uh, until they're about a year and a half. And they learn most of those commands during that time. And then they'll come in to learn some of the more advanced things here. And that would be the retrieve command, get and tug and things like that. So to apply for a canine companion service dog, um, you would first visit our website. And from there, you would request an application. And we'd kind of review that just to double check that our dogs are going to be the right fit for you. Um, we serve people who have physical and cognitive disabilities, as well as hearing loss and veterans with PTSD. Um, and so then if we go through that and we determine you might be right for our program, we'll send you a real application. Um, and after that, we'll have a phone interview and then an in-person interview. Um, and then if you go through all of that and you're accepted into our program, you'll go on a waiting list. And that waiting list can last one to two years, depending on the dogs that we have available. Um, and then we'll invite you out to a team training. And that's when you get matched up with your perfect match. We worked with several different dogs the first two days of team training. And then the professional dog trainers who were leading this class pretty much decided who goes with whom. But we did have some input and I knew that Grommet was a fit for me. 
And one way that I knew is that I tend to walk really slow. All of the other dogs would walk ahead of me and then step to look back. Walk ahead and then step to look back. And Gromit walked with me. So I knew from that first time that I worked with him that he was going to end up being the dog that I then to them. Because even eye contact, I mean, they're still dogs. They still can break their concentration yeah. and go to a person. So you always want to avoid service dogs if you can. Or ask the human if it's okay to pet the dog. I've had people ask him if it's okay to pet him. And if, if he's working, you know, are you working? Oh, can I pet you? And he's like, okay. <laughs> you know, what's he going to say? No. So, yeah. you know, you have, to, you have to, it's very respectful to talk to the person and not to the dog. Yeah, of course. And, and even medical people. I've had nurses come out to the, get me in the waiting room and talk to the dog mm -hmm. and say, come on, let's go back. And I'm like, did you want me to come too <laughs> or just him? You know, so it's definitely people need to be aware that it is insulting to have someone talk to your dog and not yeah. to you because you're still a person. Yes. You know, you wouldn't talk to someone's wheelchair. This series will hear more patient stories and provider feedback. New videos will be launched on the 26th of each month. Subscribe now so you don't miss a thing.